Welcome to the Key Chapters podcast on Galatians chapter 1. One of the topics that is most controversial among Christians is, what is the gospel? Different churches and different people have different views of the gospel, but our responsibility is to understand the gospel as presented in the Word of God. And so today we're starting our study in the book of Galatians, which clarifies what the gospel is all about. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. This is our daily podcast. It's going through the key chapters of the Bible. And today we're studying Galatians chapter 1, and we're laying the foundation for what is the gospel. So let's begin our study in the book of Galatians with a brief overview. The book of Galatians, or the letter to the Galatians, is one of the first books of the Bible written after Jesus commissioned the disciples to go into all the world with the gospel. Although it feels like we're midway through the New Testament, We have to understand that this letter was written before any of the Gospels were written, before the book of Romans was written, or the letters to the Corinthians were written, or only the book of James is considered to have been written earlier. And so that fact alone has to fold into our understanding of the book of Galatians and how this letter then sets the tone for the rest of the New Testament. See, when you look at the New Testament books, you're going to find that they build on each other and they follow a loose theme. And the first book that explored in-depth doctrine is the book of Galatians. And the primary focus of the book of Galatians is how we entered into a relationship with God and what it means to walk with Him. And so I'm really looking forward to this study in Galatians with you. I think it's going to be a rich study as we just go through this book. We're not going to be able to go through every chapter, but we will be working through the highlights. And so with that, let's start in Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul opens this letter with his customary greetings of verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Now, ancient letters would often start with the author's name and the recipient, and and that was just a matter of practical necessity. These letters were written on scrolls, and, and to figure out who wrote the letter and who it's written to, you had to unroll the first few inches of the scroll and read the opening words of the first column to figure out who wrote it, And so verse 1 tells us this letter is from Paul to the churches of Galatia. Now, in verse 1, Paul also establishes that he is serving at the behest or the commissioning of Jesus. This is the Jesus who was crucified, and Paul is saying, this is the one who is risen from the dead. And so Paul is saying, I'm a servant of him. He's my Lord, I'm his herald, and I'm writing this letter to you in Galatia on behalf of him. Now, what is Galatia? Galatia was a region in the central area of what would be modern-day Turkey. Unlike many of the New Testament letters, this letter wasn't written to a specific church, but rather to a group of churches. This would be kind of like us saying, hey, to the churches of New England, this is just a region of Turkey. Now, the book of Acts records that Paul planted churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Perhaps this letter was written to these churches. We don't really know. Either way, as we work through this letter, we'll find that whoever Paul is writing to These were churches being troubled by people who were bringing in a false teaching. Now, Paul's going to get to this issue very quickly in verse 6. But before we get to verse 6, we need to pause first and look at verse 4, because verse 4 lays down the foundation of everything else that Paul's going to say. And so, starting back in verse 3, really, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul comes to verse 4, which is this key verse here. He says, Who gave himself for our sins so that... He might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And so this gets us to what is the message that Paul wants us to understand. That wording so that shows us why Jesus has come. He has come so that he might rescue us. And this is a critical principle that we need to understand about the gospel. The message of the gospel is that Jesus has come to rescue you from this evil age. He accomplished this by dying on the cross for your sins, our sins, and taking the penalty that we deserve for our sins and removing them, washing them, so that our lives are no longer an offense to a holy God. And with our sins penalty having been paid and with them having been washed, we are now reconciled to God, counted among his people who are in covenant with him, and he will, as we see here in verse 4, rescue us. Now, this is a point that's often overlooked in our day and age. I think that we assume that everyone knows, of course, Christ was on a rescue mission to save us from this evil age. And since everybody knows this, nobody says it anymore. And this has become so rarely spoken about in the churches. Many Christians are no longer understanding the gospel in these terms. 
They think of the gospel in terms of getting out of hell or, or getting God's power in their life for a better marriage or more success at work. But they don't think about the gospel in terms of being rescued from this evil age. Now, why do we need to be rescued from this evil age? Well, because it's under God's judgment and his wrath will come upon this age and everything in it. This age is evil because it's under the ways of Satan. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan is the god of this world. 1 John 5.19 says this whole world lies under his power. And therefore, everything that the world does, even the good that it does, is still under God's judgment because it is not derived from obedience to him, but rather obedience to our flesh or our own opinions, and even ultimately to Satan. And therefore, this world will face God's judgment because God classifies it as evil. But Jesus died to rescue us from it. And that is the message of the gospel, that we have been saved from this evil age. The question is how? And the question is, what does that look like? And that then brings us to really the the rest of this book here, which starts on off in verse 6. In verse 6, Paul says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So here, these folks are being tempted to desert Christ for a gospel that is no longer a gospel of grace. And look how Paul characterizes this situation in verse 6. He says they are deserting God by walking away from this gospel of grace. And so that means that to walk away from the gospel of grace means to walk away from God. It's not as though God has several ways of dealing with people and we could take our pick for which one we like best. We either come to him through the gospel of grace or we're not coming to him at all. Now, now to clarify this point, Paul writes in verses 7 to 9, he says, which is really not another, as in, that's not even a gospel. There's nothing true or salvific about it. It won't save you. So it really is not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so there are these false teachers, these, these some who are disturbing them, and, and they're coming to these churches and they're distorting the gospel. Now notice that word distort there in verse 7. They're taking the gospel, but they're altering it in such a way that it's not the gospel that Paul taught them. Now this is bad. And so in verse 8, Paul says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Now, obviously, that's incredibly strong language that that anyone, even if an angel were to bring a different gospel, he will be accursed by God for the spiritual damage that he or she is causing others. And it is amazing how many other false religions were even started by so-called angels coming and giving a message, which is ultimately a different gospel. That's all to be accursed. None of that is to be accepted or embraced. We are to only follow the gospel that we find in the word of God. So now in the book of Galatians, who are these people and what is this gospel they're bringing to this message? Well, just remember this situation. This is early on in the early church. And back then in the early days of the church, you'll remember our study from Acts chapter 2, that it began on the day of Pentecost when Peter and the apostles proclaimed the word of God. 3,000 souls were added to the ranks of Christ's people on that day. All of those people were Jewish. And the early church was exclusively Jewish until Acts chapter 8 when the Samaritans began coming to faith in Christ. But depending on how you look at it, the Samaritans are kind of halfway Jewish. And so the church didn't have a distinctly, uniquely Gentile element until Acts chapter 10 when Peter met Cornelius in Caesarea. And so because the early church was so distinctly Jewish, it was easy for Jewish believers to create this kind of hybrid connection to the Old Testament law. They saw all of the law pointing to Christ and and they saw that they could observe the Jewish festivals, they could still keep the dietary religions, and they would still follow Christ. The problem is, they began to think that this hybrid Christianity is what God wanted all along. That if a Gentile were to become a Christian, they had to become first Jewish and get circumcised and keep the law and, and then also still follow Christ. And so the early church was tempted to require everyone to become part of this hybrid Christianity. But if you remember from our study in Acts chapter 10, God himself was intervening to communicate that that's not the case. I will accept the Gentiles by faith. Now, soon after that, Paul began his missionary journeys, bringing the gospel throughout those regions. And you'll remember from Acts 13 and 14, that when Paul was in the region of Turkey on his first missionary journey, that message of grace kept stirring up a huge controversy with the Jewish folks. 
And no doubt, some of these Jewish folks were calling the people, the Jewish believers especially, to still keep the law, bringing the Gentiles in too. You, can, you just got to still keep the law. And so in Acts 15, the early church then had to take this issue on up, and they concluded that Gentiles don't have to become Jewish. They just believe in Jesus Christ. Faith enough was sufficient for salvation. Now, somewhere around this time, the book of Galatians was written. We don't exactly know. Some would say it was before the Jerusalem Council. Some would say it's afterwards. Either way, in verses 11 and 12 in our passage here, Paul lets these Galatians know that the gospel he preaches is not rooted in his own opinion. Instead, Paul has heard this gospel from the risen Lord himself. And, and not only that, in verses 13 and 14, Paul reminds them that he's very acquainted with the law and Judaism. He was more zealous than anybody. He even used to persecute the people of God. So he understands the law. He understands how these people think. He understands these false teachers. And he wants these Galatians to understand we have been redeemed from the law. And so the next set of verses encapsulates the spiritual journey he's been on. God set him apart from birth in verse 15. He revealed Christ and Paul in verse 16, specifically to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, as in they needed to know that their relationship with the Lord was not going to be based on the old covenant documents. And this revelation was so powerful from there, Paul went to the desert region of Arabia, which was far to the south and east of Israel. Then, eventually, in verse 18, three years have now passed since his conversion. Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He stays with Peter for 15 days. He then goes north to Syria and Cilicia. He met with Christians from that region. The people were excited to have met with Paul face to face because they had heard he had been persecuted in the churches, but he's now proclaiming Christ. And then Paul keeps telling the Galatians the rest of this personal journey through most of chapter 2, and we'll get to the rest of that tomorrow. But for now, as we just wrap up Galatians chapter 1, we see here the, the foundation of the gospel that Paul is laying for us, and it's the message of being saved from this present age. See, the gospel is the gospel of grace. It is the message that Jesus died for our sins to rescue us from this present age. And the reason that we need to be rescued is that this world and ourselves deserve God's wrath for our sins. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. The wage, you know, the thing that we've been earning with our life, what we've been producing, we've been earning God's judgment. And that's because we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so it doesn't matter if we don't sin all the time or if even if we're mostly good. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. And so we're all guilty. And so Jesus had to die for us. Now, what did he do when he died for us? Well, he took our sins upon himself and he gives us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus takes our sins upon himself and he gives us his righteousness. Now, how do we receive this? Well, by faith through grace. It's not something we earn. It's something we embrace. We're going to see tomorrow, Galatians 2.16, a great verse. 2.16, Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. And so Jesus came on a rescue mission. He came to save us. He came to save us from this evil age. He came to save us from the day of judgment we will face. And we're going to see over the next couple of chapters, he also came to save us from the curse of the law. And so as we wrap up our thoughts on Galatians 1, let's go back to where we began. When you think about the gospel, do you think of it in terms of being rescued from this present age? Are you living a life that reflects that you believe you need to be rescued from this age? Or are you living a life where you're basically like, I like this age. I, I only want to be rescued from hell. And that just goes back to the point that the gospel is being saved from this present age, being saved out of it. Now, there's a constant spiritual battle going on all around us. One side is trying to pull us down into legalism where Christianity is reduced to rules and regulations. The other side is trying to pull us down into licentiousness, where it doesn't matter how we live. The call of Christ is the call to leave this age and walk with Him in holiness. Not in a holiness that is found in rules and regulations, nor in a holiness that has no standards, but to walk with Christ where He is. And so as we wrap up our time in Galatians 1, 
How about we close in prayer that we might ask the Lord to just be working in our lives so that we are increasingly living by this principle that Christ is calling us to walk with him and not according to this age and to walk by the truths of the gospel. Well, we'll wrap things on up there. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. God bless.